Uh, welcome to our uh, Delta webinar. Today, I'm very pleased to be able to introduce uh, Professor Bala Krishnamurthy, uh, who is in the mathematics department at, the, at uh, Washington State University uh, in the Vancouver campus. Uh, Bala comes uh, to Washington State and has been at Washington State since 2004, but prior to that, he received his PhD at, the, at uh, UNC Chapel Hill. Uh, and his uh, focus areas are on uh, computational topology, as well as uh, several other areas of uh, applied mathematics. I think you'll get a, a really good chance to maybe see some of his research today. Today, he's going to be focusing on uh, dimensionality reduction uh, as an overview. And so uh, welcome and thank you so much for giving uh, our webinar today. Thanks, Bala. Thank you, Aurora. And thanks, everyone, for attending. Uh, I'd like to start by acknowledging funding from NSF, uh, a few different projects, but this in particular is part of uh, an NSF HDR project called Delta, Descriptors of Energy Landscape Using Topological Data Analysis. Uh, you can check it out at deltatopology.org. It's a multi-institutional team um, and dimension reduction is out there right in the middle as one of the main themes. So this is going to be a very broad overview. The idea of dimension reduction as a field is really broad. There's too many techniques out there for that. I won't be able to go into depth into each one of them or even several of them, but I want to give a, a just a lay of the land. And then towards the end, I will talk about uh, one particular application of uh, a standard dimension reduction technique that we are doing as part of Delta. So it's going to be quite generic. So if you have questions along the way, feel free to interrupt. So what is dimension reduction? This is the standard setting. You have input data. You can think of it as a matrix, uh, or you can think of M input points in some R D-dimensional space. So the upper or the capital or uppercase D will be used for a large dimension, input dimension. And the small d is the lower dimension that we want to find corresponding points, let's say yi in. So I have m points xi in some large dimensional space. And I want to find corresponding set of points yi. Either they are you know, really closely corresponding or at least approximately corresponding for d much smaller than the input dimension. Why do we care? Of course, we are given a bunch of points. We want to do a bunch of computations on them, maybe build predictive models on them. And it's always nice to not have to deal with a large dimensional input. There are other issues as well. So that's dimension reduction. You can think of the approaches to dimension reduction in broad, broadly two different categories. One is feature selection. So here I just pick a small subset D out of the D features or D dimensions. So you can think of each column of the matrix as, as a variable or a feature, and you just pick a subset of small subset D out of them. So this is what, for instance, uh, sparse regression like lasso does. In fact, you can think of, uh, there are studies in, in genomics where you want to just say that you know, this particular gene out of 50,000 of them, let's say, um, or maybe not just one, but maybe a few of them are associated with, let's say, a cancer. So that's not really building a, a regression model, but you can think of that also as a feature selection. From 50,000 odd genes, you are picking a few. Oftentimes, of course, in Lasso, you are predicting uh, another variable for which you build the model, but you don't necessarily have to have that dependent or predictive variable in all settings. So that's one way of dimension reduction is done. So you just pick a subset of the dimensions. What I will concentrate most of my time today is on the other broad way of dimension reduction where we extract features. Rather than just picking a subset of the input features, we project the data from the high dimension to the small dimension. And those small dimensions in the projected version are my uh, small selected dimensions now. So this projection is a, a continuous uh, or common theme. 
And depending upon how you do the projection, you can have linear dimension reduction. So this is the class of techniques which is exemplified by principal component analysis or multidimensional scaling. And there are several other linear methods. And I will highlight uh, those two in particular. But there are also nonlinear methods like uh, uh, local uh, Laplacian uh, embedding and uh, isomap, PSNI, that stands for uh, stochastic neighborhood embedding uh, using a T distribution, UMAP, and so on. I, I will talk about both linear and nonlinear, but there are many more in both categories. I'm not going to be able to highlight all of them. Um, but the nonlinear part is usually interesting, but also challenging from a computational point of view. So another term that people use when talking, talking about nonlinear dimensional reduction is called manifold learning. So oftentimes these two terms, nonlinear dimensional reduction and manifold learning are used um, interchangeably. So the hypothesis here is that you, the data, the X, is sampled from a low dimensional manifold, uh, but still sitting in the high dimensional space. And our goal is to learn, quote unquote, a version M lowercase d, which approximates or re recreates the original input manifold quite nicely in a low dimensional space. And often for d much smaller than the input dimension. So you could think of going from you know, hundreds of dimensions to two or three dimensions, for instance. So that's manifold learning. So when you say manifold learning, it's ubiquitous or usually synonymous at least with nonlinear dimension reduction, but you can also think of the linear dimension reduction as fitting into this manifold learning uh, paradigm. You just assume that the manifold that you, the data is assumed to be sampled from is linear or very close to linear. So PCA, multidimensional scaling, they are also manifold learning, provided you assume that the, uh, the manifold from which you're sampling is linear. But more interesting is the case when the underlying manifold from which you are sampling is uh, uh, considered nonlinear. So locally linear embedding, that's what LLE stands for, um, or Laplacian eigenmaps and so on. So even within nonlinear dimensional reduction, there are two subclasses, what I'm calling local, so local manifold learning or local nonlinear dimensional reduction, there's a bunch of techniques under that heading. And naturally, when you talk about local, the other option is global. So global nonlinear dimension reduction techniques. And that's where isomap and UMAP, PSNI and so on belong. I will, the goal today for this overview webinar is to uh, highlight features of these, in particular, these techniques. And um, then I will also talk about a particular application of UMAP to one or two data. Can we have a question? Paul, can I say one word? Mm -hmm. I, was, I was surprised when you said MDS is uh, linear. I mean, I'm, I'm sure it just depends on how you think about it. Uh, I mm -hmm. would think of it as nonlinear, global, but nonlinear. Wikipedia uh, put it under nonlinear, but this is just a technical thing. I, 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 I yeah. totally agree um, with you. It's sort of like hybrid. Uh, sure. Yeah. Um, yeah. You, you, you just, uh, yes, MDS is, uh, you are finding a low dimensional embedding of a high dimensional space. You are not necessarily assuming it's uh, uh, linear, the underlying manifold. So, yes, uh, I should correct that. But yeah, I, I think of, uh, PCA and MDS together because they are very similar, both computationally and the kind of results that they produce. Uh -huh. Good point. Uh, any other questions? So uh, when you think of nonlinear manifolds, a quintessential example that many of the, at least the earlier papers illustrate things on is the Swiss roll. So you, you imagine you have a, a, a rectangular uh, space, but then you roll it up in 3D, and that often creates challenges for the quote-unquote linear methods like PCA. 
So here is a broad comparison of good and not so good features of local versus global um, nonlinear dimensionality reduction techniques. Broadly put, uh, nearby points in the input dimension are mapped to nearby points in the projected dimension in the output lower dimensional space in all the local methods. So that's why it's a local. Nearby points stay nearby. And that, of course, is satisfied or honored in the global techniques also. So nearby map to nearby. What the global methods do in addition is that faraway points in the input space are mapped to faraway points in the project chain. And that is not honored or that the local nonlinear methods do not try to do that. So by doing that, of course, the global methods um, get you a more faithful representation of the global structure of the manifold, which again cannot be guaranteed. In some cases, um, they do end up, even the local nonlinear techniques end up doing a good job of finding global structure, but it's not guaranteed. Or at least they are not explicitly trying to capture that, while the global uh, nonlinear dimensionality reduction techniques explicitly try to capture that. But because of that, they do have to do more heavy lifting on the computational side. Um, the local techniques are all quite efficient. In particular, almost all of them end up being sparse matrix computations. Um, the default options are almost always just eigenvalue computations. And that was one of the reasons why I think I clubbed PCA and MDS because they're both eigenvalue computations. Yeah. So as I said, uh, the local methods oftentimes work well if the local geometry is Euclidean by works well here. I mean, they, they might even capture the global, some of the global geometry, but for sure the global techniques are designed to capture the global geometry better. Okay. So this is the lay of the land for the nonlinear dimensional reduction techniques. What I'm going to do now is just highlight um, PCA first, and then I talk about M MDS also because the multidimensional scaling is used as a step in the nonlinear, in most of the nonlinear dimensionality reduction techniques. And of course, uh, the motivation for many of the nonlinear dimensionality reduction techniques comes from starting with PCA. So starting with the linear technique like PCA, how do you extend it to nonlinear? So that's my plan. I'm going to highlight um, PCA, MDS, then a couple of local nonlinear dimensional introduction techniques and then a few global nonlinear dimensional introduction techniques. PCA is the kind of the go-to default approach for dimension reduction. It was proposed by Pearson back in more than 120 years back almost now. Most of you would know, but just for the sake of completeness, I'm going to describe what the principal component analysis framework does. So in general, the ith principal component is a direction or a unit vector along a line that best fits the data while being perpendicular to the previous i minus one or the first i minus one pieces. So a typical example is you have a bunch of points that maybe look like this. If you fit a line first, it'll probably go like that. And that's the first principal component. And then once you have the first principal component, here, of course, the example is in 2D. So there's only one orthogonal direction. And that's where the, the remaining um, variation best fits the data. So it's fairly straightforward to compute the principal components. It's an eigenvalue computation. So you, you take the covariance matrix, x transpose x. Uh, one over m minus one, and then find the eigenvectors. And if you arrange or sort or order the eigenvectors in the decreasing order of the variances or importance or eigenvalues, that's my W. Where does the dimension reduction come in? I did not talk about the uppercase D and lowercase D yet. This is uppercase D by D matrix. You just pick the first D pieces. So to get the projection of the Y, you just take 
the first D principal components. So this is a fairly standard ubiquitous first method that anyone would want to try for any dimension reduction. And it's very fast. It works quite well in, in many cases, but maybe not in all cases. The next technique that I want to highlight is the multidimensional scaling. It was uh, originally proposed by Ramsey, but on a different line of work. Here, you can start with the M points or and find pairwise distances in RD. Or you can also start with just a matrix of pairwise distances. You need not necessarily have a input or a point set. You can start with a bunch of pairwise distances. Given this matrix of pairwise distances, the goal is to find points in the lower dimensional space, yi, with corresponding points to those input points so that the Euclidean distance in the lower dimensions approximates the input Euclidean distance as well as possible, or the idea of approximating is in this least square sense. You minimize the square deviation between the Euclidean distance in the lower dimension minus the input dimension. Given a bunch of pairwise distances, you are finding points in the lower dimensional space. So if you think of, for instance, 2D, and if you have a bunch of points in high dimensional space, or even just the pairwise distances, you are trying to produce a scatter plot in 2D which um, faithfully shows those distances. This is again used as a key step in many of the um, nonlinear dimensional reduction techniques, which I'll come back later. There are of course generalizations. In fact, even in the PCA, I should mention there are many generalizations. PCA by default is quote unquote linear, but there are you know, kernel versions of PCA where you can try to do nonlinear versions of PCA with much of the computational um, efficiency still carrying on. I won't get into all those details uh, here. Similarly, for multidimensional scaling also, you can think of doing generalized multidimensional scaling where instead of standard Euclidean distances, you can work with some other metrics, for instance, on some Riemannian manifold and so on. Again, the classical MDS with just the Euclidean distances, you can find that by an eigenvalue computation. And so that means it's quite efficient. So those are the two. Uh, PCA, of course, is the linear technique that I want to highlight. MDS, because I want to, I will be using that as a step in the nonlinear uh, dimensional introduction techniques that I want to highlight. So now let me just start with the first local nonlinear techniques. So I want to talk about a couple of local nonlinear dimensional introduction techniques and then global dimensional introduction techniques. The first local method is called the locally linear embedding or LLE, proposed by Roweis and Saul, 2000, in a, a science paper, actually science journal or magazine. As the name suggests, you assume things or approximate things locally. So it's a nonlinear manifold learning method, but you assume that locally things are linear. So given those points, you first find some nearest neighbors of each xi, each point. By default, it, you pick a parameter k or number k and you find the k nearest neighbors. You can also equivalently use a distance cut of, let's say epsilon, all points within an epsilon ball at xi are their nearest neighbors. Then you compute the best linear reconstruction of Xi from its nearest neighbors. So this is again, a simple um, squared error minimization um, setting. So you have Xi, uh, if you just think of Xi as a linear um, combination with some weights WAJ, you're trying to find the weights so that this sum of squ uh, deviation, squared deviations is minimized. You want to set that the weights are non-negative, they add up to one, and of course, if a point J is not a nearest neighbor, then the weight is zero. So you're just finding the best linear approximation or linear interpretation, reconstruction rather, of Xi from its nearest neighbors. So you do that for each point. So now you get the WIGs, right? So you have those weights, 
So this is in the big input dimensional space, uppercase D. Now you project down to the lowercase D, you are essentially going to do a quote unquote local multidimensional scaling for the Y axis. Um, I'm putting that in quotes because what you're doing here is you find the YI with these WIJs. The WIJs are learned from the input dimensions, and then you find the, uh, the Ys in the lower dimensional space so that this sum of squared deviations is minimized. So again, they, the standard example that they give is this Swiss roll. If you look at a point here and its neighborhood, it gets kind of mapped out into this uh, flattened linear uh, projection in 2D. Okay. So again, it's, it's, it's linear. It yeah, assumes things are linear locally. The default computation is quite efficient. It's a sparse M by M, M points, number of input points, eigenvalue computation. And that is something that the global methods try to aspire to. The other local nonlinear dimension technique, dimension reduction technique that I want to talk about is Laplacian eigenmaps proposed by Misha Belkin and Partha Niyogi, 2001. They also start with a local neighborhood definition. So here they actually construct a nearest neighbor graph G. Again, you can use K for K nearest neighbors or some epsilon ball on all the points within epsilon uh, Euclidean distance of Xi are in the nearest neighbor. So you draw the edges. And you have to like in LLE, you have to assign weights, but here they use a heat kernel. This idea is that you are essentially trying to imagine or fit like a Gaussian on uh, around the point, center at the point. So the points xj that are very close to xi will get high weights. E is a parameter that you choose later. But they also propose another option is just to set all weights to be one um, for, for the nearest neighbors, of course, otherwise it's zero. But more, more formally, you have this heat kernel. And then you solve an eigenvalue problem. That's why the Laplacian, that's where the Laplacian and eigenmaps terms come in. Um, here, D is this diagonal matrix of sum of the weights for each i. So add Wij for j, put that in the diagonal, you get this diagonal matrix. And L is this standard Laplacian, the diagonal minus uh, the weight matrix. So you solve this eigenvalue problem. Ly is lambda dy, and the first d eigenvectors are precisely your y axis. Okay. So, again, efficient computation is the big uh, plus here. So, those are the two linear, sorry, local nonlinear uh, dimensional reduction techniques I want to highlight. Now, I want to talk about global nonlinear dimensional natural reduction techniques. So recall the big difference is that uh, between local and global is that nearby points in the input space get mapped to nearby points in the projection in both cases, but faraway points get mapped to faraway points. That happens only in the global nonlinear dimensional natural reduction techniques, or at least the global methods try to do that actively. Linear, the local ones might get it as a byproduct, but they don't actively try to do that. So the first um, global nonlinear dimensional reduction technique I want to talk about is ISOMAP, proposed by uh, Tenenbaum, Windy Silva, Langford, 2000. In fact, you know this was also in a science paper. This was actually right before, I think it was pages 1923 to, or 1919 to 1922, four pages was ISOMAP, and 1923 to 1926, was uh, the LLE paper. So they both appeared side by side in, in the same science journal, science issue actually. So what do they do different here? They also start by constructing this nearest neighbor graph as in LLE or um, Laplace and eigenmaps. But now they want to capture some of the global aspects. So rather than just doing local things, they find uh, this matrix of shortest path distances between every pair of 
of input points i and j on this graph g and the weight of the edges in the graph are the euclidean distance between x i and x j but then they find this shorter spot distances for all pairs what is the idea here the euclidean distances between x and x they are good proxy for the local metric in um well this should be a uppercase d they also want and but they think the the hypothesis rather is that it will also be a good proxy for the euclidean metric in the lower dimension that you want to go to also but the shortest path distances at, along g or on the graph that gives you a good estimate of the global metric as well so you do both local and global and you compute this pairwise distance matrix delta and then you just do a multi dimensional scale on delta to of course this lower dimension rd so of course you are doing a lot more work here because you have to find all pair shortest paths which the local methods don't do and the multi dimensional scaling also can be expensive but something like that is done in the other methods also but mainly it's this global computation that is more in a follow up paper um de silva and george tenenbaum proposed a couple of variants so naturally recall that the local non linear dimensional key reduction techniques all have the advantage of being computationally efficient you can do eigen value computations and you can get answers quickly for instance but this is quite a heavy lifting needs to be done so they propose two different and also as i mentioned if the manifold happens to be locally linear then the local techniques also tend to capture the global structure without doing the heavy lifting it's kind of uh, you get it for free so it would be nice if isomap could decrease the burden computationally but also if the local um if the manifold is actually curved it's not really uh locally linear but if it has more curvature can you how can you ensure that indeed actually works better in that case so they propose two variants conformal isomap and landmark isomap conformal or c isomap this was in a follow up paper in 2002 the only big difference here is that instead of the weights being just the euclidean distance they scale it by the average distance of xi to its nearest neighbors the product of that and the same value for j and the square root of that so they showed both theoretically as well as uh, computationally that by doing that the c isomap can learn curved manifolds better than just default isomap the for the theoretical proofs they assumed the uh, uniform uh, sampling of the points from the underlying manifold and so on but in practice it just works but in terms of computational efficiency remember you have to do all pair shortest paths and then the uh, multi dimensional scaling both of them are by default cubic complexity algorithms so what can we do Uh, to save some work there with that in mind they proposed this landmark isomap this is again uh, windy silva was also proposed this idea of witness complexes which some of you may be familiar with where if instead of building vector strips complex by including all points you choose some subset of points as landmark it's the same idea here so you choose out of the m input points pick some l and often times l is very small as landmarks and you build a nearest neighbor graph as before but now instead of computing the m by m all pair short path distances you only compute short path distance uh, from all points to each landmark point so if you have hundreds of points but if you only have like 10 landmark points then this matrix is only 10 by 1000 for instance instead of 1000 by 1000 so it's much smaller and then remember the next step in uh, isomap is the mds but now again you can just do a landmark mds 
What do I mean by landmark MDS? Uh, you do the MDS for just the landmark points first. So locate the landmark points in the usual MDS way, but remember L is usually taken as much smaller. And then you can locate the rem remaining points by this landmark idea using the distances from uh, those points to the landmark points. In fact, intuitively you can think of how GPS works, for instance, right? I mean, if you have a distance to three satellites, then you can fix the uniquely the location of a point. It's the same idea here. If you have enough number of landmarks, uh, actually, if L is at least um, D plus one, so if you have D plus one or more landmark points, then uh, with the distance to all those landmark points of any X, J, you can uniquely fix it and that point will be your YJ. Okay. So it saves a lot of computation and they have, again, some examples. Um, in fact, for the Swiss roll, which was a favorite data set for all these papers, they were showing that even with four landmarks points, they were able to get the reconstruction while they compare it to locally linear embedding and that gets confused by some of these. And there, of course, you know, with, with K equal to 10, there's no question of landmarks there. They were just comparing it directly to LLE. So all that is good. So so far we have seen PCA, MDS, which is used as a step in some of these nonlinear dimensional reduction techniques. In the nonlinear setting, we saw a couple of local nonlinear techniques and then global one, which is isomap and versions of isomap. It's all great, but it turns out they work well only in those toy examples, which show, and they have theoretical properties that can prove at least on the isomap side. But for real data, um, you know, they work for some cases, but not ubiquitously. And that's where the next two global dimension reduction techniques really shine. First one is called TSNE, stands for T Distributed Stochastic Neighbor Embedding, proposed by Wanda Martin and Hinton. And they have a few updates. This was the original paper. There are a few updates with computational um, improvements also. What is the idea here? Um, goes back to um, Belkin and Niyogi. Remember, they used this heat map in the local nonlinear dimensionality reduction technique, where at every point they have this heat map. So, similar to that, uh, in TSNI, they construct a probability distribution called P, let's say, over the XI. Intuitively, you want to get nearby points or so similar points get high pairwise probabilities and far away points get low probability uh, densities or PIJs. I put the uh, expression here because by default, you would think PIJ would be just, uh, these are again, you know, Gaussians, as you can see, the variance of sigma I will be determined. They have some recommendations for how to select them. By default, you would have just put PIJ as you know, the numerator here over the sum of all the uh, K not equal to L terms. But they do not do that. They instead look at this, the probability of J given I, where they only, in the denominator, they only take, uh, they keep I fixed, then vary the K for uh, other uh, points. And in the numerator, you have XI minus XK um, expression. And then they set the PIJ as PI given J plus PJ given I over 2M. Why are they doing that? It's just to be able to handle outliers. So if you if you just define it in the default fashion as uh, the expression for ij over the sum of all pairwise expressions, then it becomes too small. And when they do that projection step in the in the third step, um, you they are not able to locate the yi correctly. So that's why they do it this way. By doing it this way, they can ensure that um, the sum of the pijs over j for every i is at least one over two m. So at least it has some probability mass. So then when they run it through the rest of the pipeline, you will find coordinates for the corresponding uh, yi. Okay. So that's in the input space. They construct a similar probability distribution in the projected space over the yi that they are trying to find. 
here also they make a small distinction or small deviation rather than just picking this gaussian sum over so all the ij term rather gaussian over all sum of all terms they go or they use a t distribution a modification is motivated by the expression in the t distribution why are they doing this step here this is a curse of dimensionality effect if they don't do this remember you are going from really large dimensions to two or three dimensions in particular they uh, the title of this paper actually is visualization of a large uh, dimensional data using tsni so they were specifically proposing this for reducing things down to 2 and 3d when you go from really high dimension to 2 or 3d oftentimes points tend to get clumped together uh, so far away points might get clumped clustered too close to each other if they use the default uh, euclidean de definition so that that's why they use a t distribution which has a, a heavier tail essentially intuitively speak so now they have q and p two probability distributions p in the input space um centered at every point and q in the projected space and the idea of tc is to find these yi's locate these yi so that uh, a divergence or distance between p and q is minimized in particular they try to minimize the pullback labeler divergence between p and q so this is a, a non convex objective function but uh, they um, they have some efficient ways to at least in practice get some local minima and that actually works quite well in practice also so the big deal here is that they have good code and it works really well in many applications but of course it goes it takes it's designed to take things down to two or three d u map is perhaps the in many ways the state of the art although tsni and u map have comparable performances in in many instances it's almost like they tend to find fault or one upping on each other there are many papers like that in fact the latest one that i will mention towards the end came out uh, a couple of weeks back um it's a parametric u map where they again compare u map and different versions of u map to tsni and different versions of tsni but between tsni and u map these are the um the state of the art for dimensionality non linear dimensionality reduction techniques so u map stands for uniform manifold approximation and projection the uniform idea of course is is an assumption that the points are sampled uniformly from the underlying manifold that you are trying to approximate and then you project down to the lower dimension so the motivation is similar structure is similar to tsni but the mathematical foundations are arguably more solid more rigorous category theory for c simplicial sets it's actually quite uh, i find it quite hard to go through that paper uh, for what it's worth but one advantage uh, is that both computation as well as uh, uh, theoretically speaking the, the the reduction to higher dimensions more than 3 occurs naturally while tsni at least originally uh, was designed and proposed for reducing to 2 and 3d so you map also does it in three steps so just like tsni they find a local approximations but instead of this um, um, probabilities around gaussians uh, around uh, each points they find a local manifold approximation using fuzzy simplicial sets so the idea of probability is captured by this idea of fuzzy simplicial sets at the end of the day they find a topological representation of the input in rd so actually again this should be a big d sorry and then they also start by working or their goal is to find a similar topological representation in the lower dimension they need to find a, a yi corresponding to each xi and in the tsni case they minimize the pullback labeler divergence between two probability distributions here they have two topological representations using fuzzy simplicial sets and they find the y or the layout in uh, the lower dimension which is another way of saying find the y coordinates in the rd by minimizing a cross entropy uh, 
So instead of kulbach liebler here they minimize a cross entropy between these two representations. The details, um, I won't get into the details today, but again, notice that the structure is quite similar, but uh, arguably there is more rigorous foundations and they claim also to be much better in terms of computation. They have very uh, efficient code available. So here's uh, just a snapshot of some of the comparisons, UMAP versus TSNI versus some of the other uh, local nonlinear dimensionality reduction techniques as well as PCA, for instance. So these are just a couple of these data sets, MNIST, which is a, a database of images of digits, and Patch and MNIST is uh, similar, but bigger in terms of number of classes, images of uh, shoes and uh, purses and um, sneakers and so on. I think there are about 20 different classes there. So these are the representations of um, MNIST and fashion MNIST data sets produced by UMAP, TSNI, Laplace and eigenmaps, and PCA. Each one of these is uh, a, a digit from zero to nine by the way. So TSNI and UMAP naturally find, are able to separate them. Perhaps at least that's what they are, uh, McInnes, Healy and Melville argue in their UMAP paper that the UMAP representation is able to separate them better. So perhaps arguably the global structure is more, uh, more soundly captured by UMAP than TCE. But certainly PCA or Laplace and eigenmaps don't do a good job. Similar observations for fashion MNIST. But in, in Bala, yeah. all of these are unsupervised, so you have no knowledge yes. of them. Yes, yeah, uh, I am not, I am coming to the supervised uh, uh, version. At least I will say a couple of words about that. So all this is, yes, you give me the data set, I just find structure in that. I'm not doing any learning yet. They also report on computational efficiency. Uh, this is just, you know, and you can see the sizes of the data sets, millions of inputs in dimensions and thousands, hundreds of dimensions, even 50,000 dimensions, for instance. Um, UMAP and this FIT SNE uh, stochastic neighborhood embedding is a faster version of TSNE uh, using fast Fourier transform and interpolation. Large base is another um, similar to Laplacian eigenmaps um, that they compare to. But in particular, look at uh, eigenmaps and isomap in particular. Uh, it doesn't even finish for some of these large data sets. And that's one of the reasons why you know, UMAP and TSNI have become the state of the art. And they claim actually that UMAP is able to do much better than the default TSNI. Uh, of course, default TSNI on some of these large data sets takes orders of magnitude more time. The faster versions are faster, of course, but UMAP arguably is even better there. So based on all this, if you want to go for one nonlinear dimensional reduction technique, maybe UMAP is a good choice. But again, you might also want to try some of the others. So that's a broad overview of this big landscape of things. There are many more techniques in all these categories, uh, linear, uh, local nonlinear, global nonlinear, and so on, and variance. Uh, but since I came up to UMAP, I want to quickly talk about an application of UMAP on, a, on the kind of data sets that we have been studying in this Delta project. Um, this is a, a simple in the sense that we know what to expect uh, simulation of a nucleophilic attack. You have ethylene molecule uh, with an OH minus in water, and you do the simulation for the reaction. Here is uh, the energy landscape plotted in terms of uh, a couple of di two dihedral angles. Those are the reaction coordinates. So we know uh, what to expect. Our energy landscape topology should look like a circle with two branches based on the configuration. And we were looking at 50,000 snapshots from this simulation. Uh, we did both PCA and UMAP, but I'm only going to show what happens with UMAP. So again, remember our input is these 50,000 points 
And in each snapshot, I have X, Y, and Z coordinates for each of these atoms, plus however many waters that are thrown in. So, you know, the dimension is uh, in, in the hundreds, 100 to 200 range, depending upon how many water molecules are there. Then I'm just trying to find the structure. Can, can I recover this structure? I'm looking for a loop with uh, two kind of legs jutting out. So let's see what happens. Uh, I take the raw data. So this is just the raw X, Y, Z coordinates. And first I throw away all the water just to see if uh, you expect um, things to be much easier if you don't include the solvent first. Without the solvent raw data, this is what UMAP produces. I mean, UMAP has a bunch of parameters that you can tune, number of nearest neighbors and so on. Things don't change much. You just get a big noodle. What it latches on is this time dependence. So as the 50,000 snapshots are ordered in the time domain of the MD simulation, that is essentially what it captures. It, and the, the blue and the red are the dihedral angles. So it doesn't really capture the structure. But if we do some pre-processing, um, what I call alignment, so essentially we remove translation and rotation um, for each of the snapshots, then UMAP is able to see this circle with these two legs. So that's nice, but that's after we throw out all the waters, things you would expect will become more difficult if you include the waters. So with the solvent, if you throw back in all the water, raw data, gets back the noodle, it latches onto the time. If I align it, um, it loses the time dependency, but it does not really recover this uh, hole or the circle with the uh, legs structure, but at least it loses the time dependency, but it's a big jump. So we have tried a few other pre-processing techniques. So what we call a scrap projection is a stereographic projection, modified stereographic projection. So imagine, um, we have these um, snapshots aligned. And if I take a five angstrom, in, in, in analogy wise, if I take a, in 2D, let's say you take a five angstrom disc and then you project it on to uh, the stereographic, to a surface of a sphere in one dimensional higher. So if I do that, uh, then we seem to recover some of the structure the blue and red points in the dihedral angles separate, but we are not really explicitly seeing those loops. And we are looking at various other um, pre-processing options. And when does PCA help identify this uh, topology that we are looking for? When does UMAP identify it? And when does it not? We are looking at another class of reactions where things work sometimes, but not, and it's not really correspond. So what is the story here? So in particular, UMAP does not find this quote unquote structure of the shelf. If I just take the raw data and feed it into UMAP, I just get, I mean, it, it finds some structure, but that's not what we're looking for. So we need to do the pre-processing. So pre-processing plus UMAP works, but it still gets muddled when I add the solvent. So what classes of pre-processing work in general and for different classes of um, reactions, what would be the correct pre-processing step to do? That's, it's more of an art than science, but we are trying to make it more of a science. That's what we are working on. But um, in all this, as Henry mentioned previously, all of this is unsupervised. There's no learning. We haven't prayed yet in the temple of deep learning yet, but these days that's, you cannot avoid that. Um, so why not do that? Uh, one of the main motivations is that all these nonlinear dimensionality reduction techniques do not automatically give a map back. So if I get a point in the reduced space, let's say in the UMAP space, I don't have an immediate map back to a point in the input space, which is immediately available for PCA, for instance. So you have a, a nice way to go forward to the lower dimensional space and back to the higher dimensional space which often can be useful, especially if you are doing um, simulations or solving a system of PDEs in the high dimensional space and you want to somehow do it using this uh, reduced dimensional structure. So then you'd help if you want to go back. So the idea is to learn that map back using what else? 
uh, deep neural networks. So one standard way in which um, we can approach this is by what are called auto encoders. Um, it's essentially a neural network trained to copy input output. That's why the name auto encoders. So this is a standard structure. You have input, a bunch of layers um, for the encoding part, and that takes X and a function F, broadly put. And I get a H or hidden or code, let's say. But then I also learn the decoding part from the H, the learned hidden part, to a reconstruction R, and that's the G function. Okay, so think of these as a bunch of layers with neurons in both steps. Of course, if you want to just copy directly, then it doesn't mean much, right? So if the reconstruction is very close or exactly equal to R, then it's not doing much. But when people build these autoencoders, they will build them so as not to do that. So for one standard way to do that is to, for instance, if this H, the code that is learned in between, hidden part, if it is in much lower dimension than the input T, then that's called an under-complete autoencoder. And that can be thought of, uh, that is a dimension reduction. So you, I have learned F and in this process, I also learned the G of course, right? So I have that reverse map. So not only am I reducing the dimension, but in, in, in the training process, I am also learning the reverse map. The G can be used as the reverse map. And if G is linear and the loss function in the training the neural network is the standard mean square error, then you recover the principal components. So it, it just works, it just reproduces PCA. But of course, if F and G are nonlinear, you could possibly learn nonlinear structure. But of course, uh, the one word of caution is that if you just go berserk with giving it multiple layers and a lot of freedom, it doesn't learn much. So there is some regularity, regularization, other than sparsity that needs to be imposed, and then it learns the structure. So it, it's it's an exciting new area where, of course, you know, everyone is using deep learning plus X seems to be the theme these days. This has shown some promise in a few uh, new papers, perhaps, but one natural advantage is this reverse map. So to wrap up, this idea of combining deep learning with uh, um, unsupervised methods, nonlinear global methods, was uh, has led to this parametric UMAP. This was posted just uh, two weeks, two or three weeks back by McInnes and co-authors. What they are doing is they are trying to, instead of using um, this cross entropy term that they minimize to find the embedding, they are finding an embedding uh, using a neural network, like uh, an autoencoder essentially. So the idea is that you can get the map back also. So that's something that, um, certainly we want to explore, but I think that pre-processing would still be crucial. If, even if you take the parametric UMAP or fancy neural networks and just throw in uh, this raw data from the nucleophilic attack, you might still just get the noodle and not the structure you're looking for. And what kind of pre-processing we want to do for which kind of data is it? That's something that uh, very well will depend on the chemistry or science in general. But uh, one big question is actually, you know, since we are learning quote unquote everything these days in neural networks, can we actually learn the pre-processing step itself? If you have a bunch of uh, systems for which we know which kind of uh, pre-processing step works to get the correct structure, can we somehow learn that? So I will stop here. Wonderful, thank you so much, Bala. Let's do virtual, I'll do some virtual clapping myself. <laughs> <laughs> Very nice job. Uh, you know, I, I have to admit, I'm really kind of bowled over by how recent most of these papers are and the overall research mm -hmm. seems to be very, very new in this area in mathematics. And, and you know, I had thought that um, really a, a lot of this was done more kind of, you know, 20, 30-ish years ago, and certainly some of it's there, but I didn't realize that there's such a real rapid advancement within the last two years. And so I think it's very timely that, you know, we're asking these questions of these techniques yeah. on these chemical systems. That was, that was very informative. Yes. 
Other thoughts and questions for Bala today? I, I had a question, Bala. So sure. I, I, I appreciate your comment about um, autoencoders. If you have linear, mm -hmm. um, a linear network, then you just get PCA. I, I didn't yeah. know that. Is yeah. the is the training there quite easy? Training the neural network, like, is it sort of impossible to get stuck in local minima? Do you? No, is that is a challenge. In oh, fact, there's a whole bunch of. I was looking at the deep learning book uh, on this autoencoder. There's a chapter there. Uh, even even in the linear case where you recover PCA. No, right? in the linear, it's probably uh, easy. Yeah, yeah, but, yeah, yeah. I, yeah, yeah. In the nonlinear case, yeah, I certainly yeah. think it. Yeah. Another question, I, uh, mm -hmm. you know, some of the older techniques, you know, we're, we come from similar areas, so I have a, a related background to yours. I learned about self-organizing maps only within yep. the last five years. Would you put that, those, how would you put those in those, this framework, or do they fit in this framework? Yeah, it's, uh, it, it's somewhat similar, right? It's unsupervised. It, it tries to learn it. Um, Again, there, there are several other techniques, you know, kernel extensions of PCA and kernel extensions of nonlinear techniques. There's a whole zoo, as I said, of techniques. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, I, perhaps why UMAP and PSNI are as popular as they are is that they have very efficient code. Um, so if autoencoders or, or the self-organizing maps are very good code, then people will try it and Maybe if, if it uh, clicks for a few applications, it'll become popular. I think. Thanks. Awesome. Other comments or questions for Bala?